What if I told you that you had two brains? Would you believe me? Well, on today's episode, you're going to learn more about what that actually means. My guest today is Dr. Marina Buxif. She's a holistic nutritionist, a clinical herbalist, and a pharmacist. You're going to hear about her journey to becoming a pharmacist, as well as the work she's doing in the realm of natural remedies, holistic medicine, and clinical herbalism, and how she's helping people improve their life and their mental health by tapping into their second brain. I want to ask you for some help. Can you share this podcast, this episode, with five of your friends who might benefit from this presentation today? And get the word out about the Mindful Farm Deep podcast. I need your support. I want this this podcast to reach more people uh, and to reach your people. So do me a favor. Share this podcast with five of your friends. Subscribe to it so that whenever I post a new episode, you'll, you'll get the notification on your phone. I know a lot of us don't like notifications, but make an exception for me, would you? Share this podcast. Like it wherever you listen. And stay tuned to what's ahead. You're listening to the Mindful Farm D podcast. Welcome and a thousand thanks for tuning in. This podcast is about all of us. I'm your host and the mind behind the microphone, Matt Manharrow. My focus on this podcast is to explore the mind through genuine conversations, thought-provoking ideas, and the reality that the story of mental health is incomplete. Thank you for listening today to the Mindful Farm D. Again, I'm the mind behind the microphone, Matt Harrell. And my guest today is very special. Um, I met her through LinkedIn and we connected and we, we uh, like each other's message and, and what we're standing for and what, and specifically what she's been working on within the realm of holistic medicine. She's a clinical herbalist uh, and she's also a pharmacist. Um, and I, I put it in that order for a reason. I, I think sometimes we make the mistakes of thinking that pharmacists are solely focused on dispensing medications. Uh, but Dr. Marina books of is showing that that is not the case. And, um, she's done some great work, which she'll talk about here in just a minute, does some great work in the space of holistic medicine and, uh, clinical herbalism. And so Dr. Marina books of, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So, tell us, tell me a little bit about your journey on how you became a pharmacist, a holistic uh, health coach, and clinical herbalist. Yeah, so it's been an interesting and wild journey, I guess. <laughs> Not very typical, but basically, I wasn't sure what I even wanted to do growing up. I didn't really have any big aspirations, nor had any particular pressuring from my family, so I just kind of started thinking about it in high school as I was applying for colleges, you know, what I should even do with my life, but I always excelled in the sciences, and particularly the hard sciences, <laughs> so uh, my, my uh, parents are actually both chemists and biologists, so uh, they majored technically in biology, but they had enough credit to have a dual degree here in the state based on their education in Belarus. So basically, they, my dad proposed that I check out pharmacy since that combines a lot of scientific, you know, chemistry and all of that stuff. He also used to be a chemistry teacher, by the way. So I he said, okay, let's um, maybe some applied, you know, chemistry and biology and action, pharmacy field, check it out. So I did. And he actually also 
uh, helped me find an opportunity to intern at a local pharmacy and just observe, like, what is, you know, what goes on (laughs) to see if I would even like that kind of practice. Uh, And it was an independent retail pharmacy, uh, and they actually just took me on as as a worker, as a clerk. And eventually a technician. So um, instead of just observing, I actually got to do a lot of hands-on stuff. And as I was finishing up high school and starting eventually pharmacy school, I just just got that position and learned a lot from the pharmacist there. And in particular, that pharmacist um, specialized herself in naturopathic medicine, and Mm. she did another degree so as I was working for her she co- she was completing her naturopathy degree so I kind of learned from that uh, just looking at things from that angle from her seeing her in action and then also in school I took an elective called complementary and alternative medicine mm. and it was led by a wonderful teacher who was really inspiring so those factors as well as we had a club for complementary alternative medicine led by some also great students. So it kind of opened up the space for me that it is possible to work with natural medicine and herbs in the space of pharmacy because other people are also interested in it and also doing it. And um, that was really inspiring. And so as I was graduating, I found myself not really fitting in or wanting to do anything that was available to me, not really connecting too much to either clinical pharmacy or fellowships and doing a big industry with pharma. Um, All of those were really great coveted positions, and I did apply to a bunch of them, but I found myself not really wanting to even go, and Mm -hmm. I ended up turning one offer down because I just didn't see myself ultimately being happy with that role internally, even mm-hmm. though externally it's a great position. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. And so, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, I, I really do wish that a lot of uh, pharmacy schools had a, and I think it's changing and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it's changing that we are seeing sort of this shift in terms of how our how students are trained today in pharmacy school. But when I was going through pharmacy school all those years ago, um, I didn't know anything about, uh, you know, holistic medicine or nobody talked really about holistic medicine. It was really just residencies and community pharmacy um, was sort of the the boxes that they that they put us in. Um, but, you know, your story, you're finding out or you found out that there was this other avenue that you could that you could explore. Um, and dive into right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So for for me, uh, it was actually three choices. So in addition to the hospital and the retail setting, the third one, which was becoming really popular, would be a fellowship in a pharmaceutical industry setting, and that was you know really regarded as like the highest honor if you were accepted to one of these prestigious places. Mm. Well. So you 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 also uh, are the host of a of a podcast called the Raw Fork Podcast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do, what what work you do there, um, and the the folks you sit down with and interview? Yeah, sure. So as I went along my journey and just we're taking one step at a time, following people that I found inspiring or uh, where I would like to see myself go next. Mm-hmm. So because it wasn't a carved out path that I chose, I just ended up, you know, talking to people, networking, and asking them how they got to where they are and what steps they took, and also following some of those footsteps that resonated with me. Mm-hmm. So I just was taking one program after another, educating myself on different courses um, based on people who I follow or whether or not they were teaching it or just recommending it. And so eventually I decided that it's really inspiring to talk about these kind of stories and share our vision and our purpose, our mission uh, with other pharmacists that are also maybe thinking to themselves that they are not happy where they are and they want to go somewhere else and use their degree for something else. Because I just felt like, okay, here are those three options. I don't 
get into any of them and I don't want to be stuck in them, uh, but I also want to use my pharmacy degree. Mm. I don't want to just start all over in a new career. Yeah. Um, so I just think it's so important to, to look outside the box and then see what else could you really do with this education besides that traditional dispensing role or the roles that we mentioned. Mm. Did you did you sort of have somebody um, or anybody in your, you know, community, your network sort of, you know, helping you find that avenue um, where you were comfortable in, uh, you know, maybe a mentor or, you know, some someone in the field that you thought were was a good model to follow? Did you have that in your in your journey? I did, actually. So that teacher that I mentioned who taught the elective class for TAM, Complementary and Alternative Medicine, mm-hmm. she and I are still in touch, and I have kind of started asking her after graduating, you know, what I should look for, uh, you know, what are my next steps in guiding the right direction, and she recommended that I reach out to another past student of hers, who is Dr. Christina Tarantola. So my teacher is Dr. Regis Arya, and she recommended that I talk to uh, Dr. Tarantola. And ever since then, I just started unofficially following in Dr. Tarantola's footsteps, and she has advised me on some of the next steps to take and has been a support system for me to, uh, you know, cheer me on. Like, if I say, hey, this is what I really feel drawn towards doing right now. And even if that's not what she's doing, she's like, yeah, go for it, you know? Mm. Um, it's not, uh, it's my passion and I have to follow that. Like not really look at anyone else, but just, uh, it's important to have a support system that is cheering you on, yeah. even if they haven't been where you were before, but they believe that you could get there. So I think both, both are important, having uh, somebody exactly where you are and get exactly to where you want and also just the unwavering support of like hey even if I don't know exactly in the way it's going to happen I believe that you'll get there anyway and those two things I think uh, were provided for me and I also ended up uh, taking a course with her officially after all these years last year so we're still in touch as well. well that, that, I think that, and I think that you're, you're also giving back as well, because again, you know, and talking about your, your raw fork podcast, as I kind of look, cause I, I listen to a lot of the episodes as well. Um, and I think that again, the work you're doing is excellent and it's sort of your way in my view of, of giving back to the profession, specifically the, the professional pharmacy, because a lot of the uh, guests that you have on are pharmacists themselves doing things other than, dispensing or hospital, you know, they're, they're involved in various aspects of the field, you know, showing that these skills and, um, this education can be used for many different things. Would you agree with that? Exactly. I actually also rebranded the podcast. Okay. From this year, it's called, uh, the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. The Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. And I think now that name really reflects more of who the audience is and who are the guests. Um, because, so, you know, everything, like I said, was just kind of going one step at a time, one thing led to another. I didn't really have a grand vision of having a podcast or, um, doing what I do now exactly, but I just knew, like, I need to do something different and I need to go one step at a time to, to follow that intuition and that call. So in terms of my podcast, I actually started first blogging. So I would just mm-hmm. blog about my life or <laughs> yeah. what I'm doing or, do, yeah, do some research articles about, like, you know, the health trends or fads that are going on and actually going and looking at the research because I am trained as a pharmacist and we look at research and to see what, you know, what is the verdict. There's so many opinions out there and advice that's going around. So I really use my blog to, uh, to talk about that, to do the research and also just talk about my journey. And so my first podcast then was just me literally reading some of my blog posts out loud. <laughs> and then my starting from the second season, I started interviewing like-minded professionals. Mm. Uh, so I focused on both herbalists and pharmacists. And then really 
three season three with just all pharmacists. And so I think this is where I'm going to go from here and just for now really getting those pharmacist stories out there. Excellent. Yeah. And, and I, and I, I wanted to harp on that for a little bit because I know for a fact that there are some pharmacy students who um, listen to my podcast. And so, and when I'm out in the field and I'm out at work and stuff, I, I, I tell students all the time, think other than right now I'm in, I'm in um, dispensing pharmacy, community pharmacy, but you know, think outside of this there. What are you passionate about? Find something that you're interested in. Uh, don't just limit yourself to what you're doing right now as an intern, you know, get out there, um, learn some new stuff, learn some new skills and, you know, really show your heart, show what you're interested in. Because I think a lot of us join this profession because we really want to help at the end of the day, right? We want to help somebody on their path to, you know, becoming healthier, or, you know, and so, yeah. you know, doing something besides what we've been told traditionally is our lane, right? Stay in your lane. <laughs> We can do so many different things. And so I think, I think reading and hearing about your story uh, and others like you uh, can be and is inspiring for others. So that's why I wanted to stay there a little bit. Um, Before we shift though, I I did want to ask you about if you're still doing work with farm to table. Um, Are you still associated with uh, that organization? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, What's some of the work? I want to also comment. Yeah. I want to comment about staying in your lane and, I forget the exact quote, but basically, you know, nobody that ever did anything great has done it by staying in their lane. Yes. You know, yep. it's always out of, out of the box thinking is going to get you to somewhere new if you just keep doing what you're told or just put your head down and, you know, do the work and not question the status quo. Mm. Quote, um, you know, it's not going to change. So in order for things to change and transform, you have to actually transform yourself first and get those limits out of your mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, uh, farm to table, what are you, what are you doing with that organization? What kind of work are you doing there? So farm to table is a telehealth platform where a team of functional medicine pharmacists have gotten together and are offering consulting services to the general public. Mm -hmm. So we basically have appointments with patients and clients who want to improve their health in some way or have a a disease state of some sort and they just aren't getting any answers through traditional doctors or other practitioners that they have gone to. And functional medicine, it just really tries to get to the root cause of a disease state rather than covering it up you know, covering the symptoms up, putting a Band-Aid on it, uh, which often does happen where we have some chronic disease state and then we have to chronically be on a medication, but the root cause is still there and still not addressed, so it's just going to still keep giving rise to certain pattern and certain disease. So uh, we're really trying to get to the bottom of things, find the common pattern that a person is presenting with, Sometimes we'll recommend follow-up testing um, because general labs don't always cover what we would want to know mm-hmm. about the patient. So sometimes we'll have a extra additional lab work that we send them for. And then we also work with a team of doctors as part of collaborative practice. And they sign off on our orders or recommendations or the, the patient can go to, to both of us, us and a doctor and um, get prescriptions through the doctor and certain lab testing um, approved by the doctor. But we're there as kind of their go-to person that they consult with that's managing their care. Gotcha. And so that that, uh, website, if people wanted to find more about, more information about how to connect with you there, where, where should they go? How can they find that out? That life, mm-hmm. and that's the blog and the whole platform run by the owner and creator, which is Dr. Melody Hartzler. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, if you want to go to my site specifically, it's uh, the R Marina Books of Dr. Marina Books of that A Zoba A Z O V A dot com. Gotcha, and I'll put that in the show notes. And I think um, that's actually where I got this uh, article that I want to talk to you about. 
today um, about this idea of the second brain. You know, my my podcast here, this folk, my focus really is on mental health. Um, and so I wanted to ask you what, you know, in what ways or how would you describe the importance of mental health and herbalism, uh, nutrition and the, and the, you know, the healing arts as they're called, how would you describe the importance of those, uh, those things and their interconnectedness? Yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. I really see everything as being interconnected, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, as part of my studies and just really uh, recognizing that the health of a person really does depend on more than just one isolated incident, you know, or one factor that's contributing it to it. It's usually, like I was mentioning before, a systematic pattern that just goes up and just occurs in several different places at once. And, you know, just like the who has defined health, I always go back to this, it's the definition of health is physical, mental, and spiritual well-being all in one. Mm-hmm. So we you know, I find that we do have this dichotomy and this duality in life in general where we suffer things out and we uh, try to isolate things, but really the mind and body connection is so interlinked, intertwined, and it's so important to address both, you know, because one of them will influence the other. You know, you can't have a healthy body without a healthy mind and vice versa. Vice versa, they yeah. are both informing each other at any given time and you know, um, it's, it's good to have a practice of recognizing that and reconciling those two together and helping each of them have this positive feedback effect and affect positively on one, one another. Gotcha. So, so this second brain then for, for those who might not be familiar with that terminology is the gut we're talking about gut health, right? Yes. Yeah. And Right? We have the central nervous system that mostly lives in the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have the ANS, which is the autonomic nervous system, which is governing our parasympathetic function all over the body, uh, the rest and the gut. And then you have your enteric nervous system, which lives in your gut. So it's physically there. You know, you have a bunch of nerves and a bunch of neurotransmitters that are communicating up to your CNS. And at the same time, so it's the neural tissue and real chemicals that are being transmitted and communicating with the blood and brain. And at the same time, it's it's living in your physical gut. So that's literally connecting your mind to your physical body. You know? So it's, it's so interesting how that works. And I always say want to treat the gut first as that's just the foundation of all health, all disease begins in the gut. Um, so I just really follow that principle of no matter what you're coming in to me for, I always want to know what is going on with your gut because it's affecting so much mm. uh, and it's really intertwined with mental health as well. Absolutely. And, and, you know, when, when you, as I listen to you speak and, um, you know, you look at, I looked at websites like John Hopkins, for example, they talk about how researchers are finding evidence that irritation in the gastrointestinal system may send signals to the CNS, like you said, the central nervous system that trigger mood changes. And these new findings explain why, for example, a higher than normal percentage of people with irritable bowel syndrome and functional bowel problems develop depression and anxiety. And then they also note that it's important. This is important to know because up to 30 to 40 percent of the population has functional bowel problems at some point. You know, when I hear that 30 to 40 percent of the population at some point has bowel problems. I mean, I know that like you systemically mental health can can be affected by so many different things. Um, You know, life cycle, where you are in your life uh, can be affected by your past. But then when you when you break it down and you look at where you are right now, your current mental health state, you you have to ask the question, which is what you do. What's going on with your gut? Uh, What's happening, you know, in your in your gut? And so, you know, what what type of mental health issues do you typically see from you know, clients coming to see you. Yeah, I would agree with you about all the ones that you mentioned. 
mentioned, uh, I think the main thing that I really see across the board is people are just not happy with where they are, you know, like some kind of missing piece to the puzzle, to their life purpose, to their mission, some missing links to spirituality perhaps, mm. you know, some missing idea or picture of where they fit in in the world and what their place and purpose is uh, because not to have a purpose is, you know, just kind of leaves the person feeling aimless, right? And so I think just some kind of grounding and some big picture understanding of their life and their life having a meaning. You know, everybody wants to contribute positively on someone else's life or in the grand scheme of things, they want their life to matter. You know, they don't want to just live their whole life and not do anything positive or meaningful. So I really see that in one way or another, you know, it, it comes as anxiety, it comes as depression, it comes as IBS, it comes as a lot of different things and PTSD, but it's overall just, I think this is like really the big missing link that people are grasping on and that's why it's contributing to all the mental health issues and mm-hmm. I also think lack of community and just feeling lonely and isolated especially now that it's pretty much been taken away from us to to coexist with other people in right. physical space yeah. together for, so, over, over, for over a year now you know um, yeah 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 it's Even been before tough. that you know yeah. people I think because of all this computer stuff and innovation and yes. technology yep. and screen time, I think we were already kind of feeling it and, you know, communities were kind of falling apart and families weren't staying together and because it's such a global world, everybody's like moving away from families or different opportunities. So it's, you know, it's both good and bad, right? Like yeah. it's so great that we have technology like uh, Skype or uh, Zoom or video calling and internet and social media. But at the same time, like, there's this primal animal instinct in us yeah. that we're just not uh, helping to address or helping to that part of us and that part of the soul that's wanting just physical connection to other beings uh, and also just some time without the screens. And, um, you know, I think just our pressures of society or self-imposed pressures are just giving us, um, not giving us, the option to live like a wholehearted, authentic way yeah. like, where we feel like we can just truly embody our whole being and not feel judgment and just like do whatever we want and get pleasure out of life. Like we always feel like there's pressures that first we have to do something unpleasant or like, <laughs> you know, please somebody else. And I think that's just where the disconnect is that contributes to a lot of mental health issues. Absolutely. And, you know, in this in this article, too, and I want to I want to kind of spend some time breaking down what we mean by and what you mean by the gut, Um, because people think, well, okay, it's just the stomach. But no, you know, for for I want to assume that there's not the professional, just the professional listening to this podcast. Right. And so when we in in this article, in this article, which I'm going to include a link to it in the show notes, you break down from mouth to anus what exactly is involved in <laughs> this this uh this second brain um and I, I i know you know we're you probably don't have the time here today to just unpack all of that which again would be a great read for people to go back and read that article but just at a high level can you can you break down this digestive system again from from mouth to anus and how the factors you know what we eat uh what we consume um, how it might impact our mental health. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason I wrote that article is because I was actually really informed on the anatomy of the gut uh, from the mouth to the anus and all the functions in between um, from my seventh grade health class. So I'm wow. a really great teacher <laughs> and I just, yeah. He really uh, taught me the basics, and then, you know, I would relearn it over and over again in (laughs) in high school biology and then in college and in my own research, and, you know, it's just so important to realize that our whole body, as as I was saying, and mind are working together 
Uh, but also to see where each organ, uh, you know, what each organ is doing from, let's say, when you swallow a bite of food to where it's excreted as waste or absorbed as nutrients. Mm-hmm. And every part of your anatomy is helping to process that food in some way so that you, you do get the nutrition from it and then whatever you don't need is discarded. And that's the way our beautiful body was designed. Yeah. Uh, and it's also really interesting to note that that whole uh, process of the digestive system, uh, if you can think of each organ following one another as a hollow tube and the food is traveling through it, the inside of that tube is actually never touching the inside of your body. Mm. So it's, it's something that exists outside of you, but also inside of you. So it's, it's you know, formed into all these different convoluted tubes and areas, right. but it's protecting, you know, your blood and your uh, inside organs are never actually physically coming in touch with the food that is existing in this hollow space. Um, and the functions of those organs are really to break everything down so that it's only the smallest nutrient molecules are getting absorbed in the small intestine. And the problem with a lot of actually disease states that are prevalent nowadays with inflammation and autoimmunity happens because there's a problem with the absorption process mm-hmm. and bigger molecules are getting absorbed because of gap junctions not being tight enough in a small intestine. And then that's where you have a host of other problems. But all that is to say that if we look at each organ that is forming this gastrointestinal tube, right, Mm -hmm. uh, that's digesting your food, if we look at each of them separately, they all have a very specific function, purpose, and we can support them in very specific ways. So if we optimize each step of the digestion, we will optimize our health and we will decrease inflammation and we will increase our mental health capacity because most of your serotonin is actually produced in the gut. And I did not know that. Of, yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, it's really interesting because we think about serotonin as and that's only, but it is right there in your entire system. Wow. And uh, so I think the way I wrote the article is really just, just in form of how we can support and optimize each stage and each of the organs that the food is going through. What is the purpose of it being there? You know, what enzymes are secreted and things like that. And really just to bring home the foundation where it's just like, any part of health, you need a really strong foundation before you even look at something higher upstream that's causing an issue. You have to make sure all your foundational building blocks are intact and strong so that you, uh, you don't start to, you know, put a band-aid on your skin when there's, like, still a bunch of uh, blood and your blood's not clotting properly. So you mm. have to address that first or putting on a Band-Aid. Right. Um, so that's exactly what it is with the digestive system. It actually uses up most of our energy to digest food. So this is why a lot of people are also coming down with chronic fatigue syndromes and things like that. So if we really optimize this huge body system, we are going to just have positive impacts all over the place, including mental health and fatigue and those issues that are so prevalent. Uh, so by the foundation, I mean really just each step at a time. So we start at step one, and step one is actually digesting in your mind. So that's <laughs> another mental health link. Yep. When you're actually looking forward to the food, when you know you're about to eat a meal, when you're cooking the meal and you're smelling all the amazing scents, it's going to tantalize your salivary glands to start watering. And also the rest of your enzymes which are being secreted with the gallbladder and the bile and the pancreas. So all of your organs are actually getting stimulated by you sensing uh, either visually the food or... Or even just thinking about it. Yeah, just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah.
rather than, you know, scarfing something down because you're so busy. Man, I, I need to... Like I need to let my son, he's, he's eight. I need to let him listen to this because I tell him all, all the time, slow down, man. Like you're eating too fast. Like you, <laughs> you can't even enjoy this food. You have to, you have to slow down. But you know what, what you're saying too, it really does take meal planning to the, to, to a whole new level. It's not just about, you know, deciding what you're going to eat Monday through Sunday or Sunday through Sunday, but th- you know, thinking about the food and, and, and you know, how it's going to taste all of this stuff starts the, the biological process um like you said that happens in your mind uh, i just I, I just think that's fascinating but anyway go ahead you can keep <laughs> you can keep on yeah, talking it's super fascinating. Yeah. and that's exactly why it's the second brain so yeah. it all just you know your body is designed to to function like this and i'm not making this up so uh when, and this is another reason why cooking food for yourself is also super therapeutic because mm. you're actually taking the time to Care and prepare something, you know, for yourself, your loved ones. You're literally putting your love and your intention into the food. So I always say, like, you better be cooking with a good mood <laughs> because right. you don't want to um, put bad juju into the food or anything like that. Um, so I think, you know, because everything is just so fast paced and so convenient and instant gratification, uh, even like the art of preparing food and uh, why it's so important that, you know, our grandmas would, like, their food for us and our parents and things like that, but in our generation, that's severely lacking. Oh, and it's yeah. not, it doesn't just come down to the nutrients in the food or lack thereof or, you know, the processing of the food, although that is very important, but also just the way we consume the food, the way we prepare the food for ourselves with what intention, what mood, um, the way we're sitting down and saying great, like, just being grateful the fact that we have the food in front of us, which is another big mental health um, tip, is just to find something that you're grateful for and be in that frequency mm. of gratitude yeah. rather than sensing a lack of something. You know, and just always having that shift of, okay, maybe, you know, I, I'm upset about this and that, but hey, look at this. That's so great in my life. And yeah. I could be grateful for this and put myself more into that joyful state. And just just that alone, like, it's not saying, like, just be delusional about your life, but um, keep on shifting to the good stuff and attracting more of that good stuff. Yeah. I, I hope people listening to this, the next time they sit down to have a meal, they'll, they'll think about your words and, and look at that food a little bit differently than, you know, than, than what they might have used to uh, or what they might have looked at, how they might have looked at the, at the meal in the past. Just really, again, consider what you're consuming, um, and, um, you know, a process that not only in the, in the mind that's in your head, but also in the mind that's in your, in your stomach, um, and how that works. One of the things you pointed out in that article too, um, if you have time to, to talk about it was this, this thing called gaps, gut and psychology syndrome. Um, and I know that people typically like to harp on diets and fads and, you know, we've got the keto diet, this, we've got this, this diet, that, and and you can get really lost in what exactly you should be doing when you're trying to improve, um, not only your physical health, but your mental health. Uh, but what, what is it, it, I guess in a, again, in a high level, can you sort of talk a little bit about what gaps is gut and psychology syndrome? Yeah. So this is the work of Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. Um, she wrote a whole book about it with lots of different studies and evidence mm-hmm. uh, for the people that want that. And basically, she outlines that there's a huge connection to, again, the second brain being in your intestines and uh, affecting your mental health. In particular, she researches the link to autism, which again, has become a new prevalent mm-hmm. disease state for a lot of our younger generation. And there's this debate of whether or not we're, you know, diagnosing it more rigorously nowadays it, or if it's something else. Some people think it's vaccines. But basically, uh, her theory and hypothesis is that it's actually because there's just so much inflammation in the gut and the gap junctions that I mentioned before in yeah. your small intestines, which should be very, very tight, um, are actually having some spaces between them and allowing bigger molecules to permeate through your internal organs 
and into your bloodstream, which is causing a lot of downstream inflammatory effects, including autoimmune conditions and autism. So there's a whole protocol of how to feel that and support your body in, in healing those mm. uh, gap junctions. And another big topic that I didn't mention yet is the microbiome. Yep. So this is basically the friendly bacteria that live in our gut, particularly our large intestine, where they're helping us to uh, extract more vitamins from our food um, and protect us from pathogenic bacteria and just do a whole lot of other processing things for us. And it's now been studied uh, super well that this, this uh, microbiome, the diversity of all the that are living in there is super important in order to uh, protect us and do the functions that they're supposed to do and help us uh, help our immune function thrive and give us basically all, all those enzymes and mineral, minerals from our food that need to happen at that last step. So uh, a lot of research is done with both the microbiome and the leaky gut as that um, small intestine inflammation has become known as. So those two areas are really big right now, and different diets do help heal those gap junctions and do help repopulate your microbiome, and that's really what I recommend my clients, to use food and herbs as medicine um, to to heal those functions so that they can get healthy in whatever they're dealing with. Excellent. Yeah. And so, you know, again, for, for the listeners, I think going back to this article is a good place to start understanding this uh, connection. Like you said, there are a lot of different research, uh, research out there and books out there. But I, re- I really thought that this article that you wrote um, on your website was very um, informative and very um, thorough, you know, really highlighted again. And, and I mean, I'm reading it and some of the some of the phrases in there, for example, when you talk about. Um, prebiotics. I actually had a, a, a client or a customer come into the store, uh, my store the other day and ask me a question about prebiotics. And I got to be honest, I was stuck. Like I didn't, I didn't really know what she was talking about. And I think it speaks too to how educated our uh, clients are and our customers are nowadays, um, which is a good thing uh, because again, it, they, they sort of for the longest time have just relied on the professional to sort of tell them what they should be doing. But with, in the advent of the internet and uh, just uh, you know information available online, uh, so much available online, they can sort of do their own research. But it's also a bad thing because then they self-diagnose. But anyway, this woman came in and she's asking me about prebiotics and and stuff. I could talk to her about probiotics, but I had no idea that these things were uh, were different. Um, and your article, uh, you know, speaks to that uh, as well, and you know, talks a little about a little bit about you know using salmon and um, uh, bone broth, for example, to help heal some of these things uh, with regard to the gut and psychology syndrome diet or the GAPS diet. Um, and so I just thought that that was that that article was was very helpful. So yeah, yeah, the GAPS diet really just focuses again on healing those leaky junctions and on repopulating the microbiome. So that the system is just optimized for anti-inflammatory effects and also to detoxify. Because the link again with like the vaccines that people are proposing, Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it's not the cause, but perhaps it does contribute where the body is already so burdened by all the toxins that it has to deal with that sometimes it just will take you know one little cherry on top to throw the whole system. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so that's another big area of research that people are coming up with that actually the toxicity that we're just faced with and we just keep on getting more and more used to it because, again, we're survivors and we're evolving all the time. But our organs of elimination, which includes the digestive system and the liver and the kidneys, are just already so burdened and they don't have enough good nutrients and cofactors that are supposed to be in our food, and our food is currently devoid of most of them. Mm. So because we're not providing these extra cofactors that are necessary for the detox reaction, 
that's why we are just unable to fully detox uh, our bodies and really thrive in our health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I know we're running out of time, but I, I, I've got to talk to you too, really quick, quickly. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this this came across uh, my proverbial desk uh, because I'm actually watching a television show. Uh, it's a popular one, but one of the one of the uh, I guess characters or um, it's a reality TV show. So one of the guests, his diet consists of only meat and eggs. Okay. And you find out later in the episodes that the reason he's doing this is because he has some issues with his gut and he's, he's going to, you know, go later on, um, and have some tests done and some, um, you know, to try to understand exactly, you know, what he's allergic to or what's upsetting his stomach that affects his other, the other aspects of his health. So are you, and this question might be a little bit out of left field, but are you, familiar with that that approach to dieting just you know meat and eggs only as a way to reset the the microbiome yeah i actually hearing about the carnivore diet and it sounds like it where you only you know animal food um in particular meat Mm -hmm. uh so i feel like that is definitely not a sustainable diet Mm -hmm. for a long period of time but for some people that are super inflamed and really unable to digest food well or are having, you know, probably a bunch of the organs that I mentioned before as part of the digestive system are out of whack. And, you know, so maybe some things are where they're not supposed to be, like, for example, SIBO, which is an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine when as I mentioned, it should actually be in the large intestine. So um, it could just release things like both constantly being flatulent and gassy mm-hmm. and having abdominal cramps after everything that they eat. So no matter what they eat, this, you know, this is a symptom that they get. So when you're so inflamed that seeing anything hurts you, um, this sounds like maybe time for some really easy to to digest meals and for us it's actually easier to digest things like meat because it's uh, you know the animal has already taken in all the nutrients and we're just mm. literally using these things as building blocks however um, it still probably wouldn't be my approach to put somebody in a diet like this um, it, for me I really like uh, the bone broth I think you mentioned it this yep. is part of the gap diet yep. so it is you know it is deep perhaps but it's actually breaking down the collagen in the bone and the gelatin in the bone so rather than focusing on the meat which right. is fatty or protein rich it's um super easy for your body to digest uh actual amino acids that come out into the broth that help you rebuild your your own collagen and your structure and heal uh, those loose gut um, barriers and uh, really easy for your body to assimilate that rather than getting yourself so much protein from animal sources which uh, again I, I don't think it's healthy especially not in the long run but mm-hmm. for some people they are seeing a result of decreasing inflammation if you know if they're in a really bad shape before mm-hmm. um so yeah, maybe there's some validity to it, but for me, I really prefer liquids and herbs and bone broth and uh, more of a plant-based approach. So if you can't have, let's say, raw veggies that are often hard for people to digest, or even ferments, which are super healthy but sometimes hard for people to digest, um, I would rather put in um, into like a broth a bunch of veggies and cook them down really well. And gotcha. It really helps to digest them. Gotcha. Excellent. And and yeah, that's a that's a very practical um, approach uh, to this. And you know that if you're interested, that guy's been doing this diet for three years, <laughs> which I thought was just meat and eggs, bre- breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! But um, you know, Doctor Booksif, again, I, I thank you so much for uh, being on the show with me, and I look forward to working with you again and talking with you again in the future. Um, I did want to ask you the one last question as we close out um, about 
what what would you suggest or what are some things, maybe one or two, that you might suggest for listeners that they can do as a first step uh, in improving their mental health uh, naturally? I think just pausing. That's been my answer a lot for, for a lot of questions recently. So just really pausing. Whatever yeah. you're doing, just take a brief pause away from your life. You know, step out for one second. Give yourself that grace and that space to just be. And really try to tune in to your body and just feel present in your body. You know, you don't have to go crazy with trying to meditate and mm-hmm. trying to have a blank, you know, <laughs> yep. sleep or a blank mind. Yep. Uh, but just really focus on uh, the present moment and what you're feeling like in your body, you know, and really try to identify, like, if there's a pain somewhere, where is it? You know, what is the quality of the pain? or attention somewhere and really try to send those areas uh, your breath and send some love to those areas that are feeling like maybe neglected or in need for special care. Um, just giving yourself some of those periods of just pausing and assessing exactly where you are and what you're feeling and then addressing it if possible. Great, 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 great. Excellent. And so again, thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, For the listeners, if you want to know more about Dr. Marina Buxov and the work she's doing, you can check her out, her personal website. That's Dr. 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 Marina Buxov, B-U-K-S-O-V dot com. And I'll include that link in your or in my show notes as well so you can get to it. Um, Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here, and I look forward to inviting you to my show as well. Yeah, I look forward to it.